Hey, everybody. Welcome to Sama, Seattle Circuit Music and Art. I'm Derek Mazzoni. Great to have you here. Um, it's a special edition of Sama where we're going to be speaking to somebody who plays an important uh, role in making sure that global music, global sacred music, sacred music, all types of music within this space has an opportunity to, to be heard and seen. I'm talking about Chris Ekman co-founder of Glitter Beat Records. My opinion, uh, probably the most important global music label um, putting stuff out today. It's not my only opinion only. Um, Womex, which is a pretty amazing uh, festival, curation system, organization, also agrees. Uh, Glitter Beats won uh, best label of the year um, multiple times. Um, I've known Chris for years. We're in Seattle, obviously, and Chris was here in Seattle till 2002 when he moved to Slovenia. He was part of the Walkman, a great uh, label here on Sub Pop. And, um, you know, he, he was here at an interesting time in Seattle where it was a small town. It wasn't like the hub of technology and um, I guess technology, coffee, food culture per se. Um, and now it has grown and he played a part in that and saw the transition and more awareness of the city. The reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, Chris um, decided to, we'll find out exactly why he decided to uh, to found Glitter Beat, but he's been traveling. He was, um, he was uh, spent a bunch of time in West Africa. He uh, discovered all of these phenomenal artists that just didn't get a chance to be heard or seen at uh, a particular time. Um, now um, there are less gatekeepers and a lot more of these artists have an opportunity to share their work, but we're now we're dealing with a situation where there's more than ever before. So curation, editing, not as in cutting, but as in selecting plays a more important part than ever. He's a, a fascinating person. He's a producer, musician, does soundtracks. This guy does it all. And it's great to have him here on Sama. Hey, Chris. Hey. Good Thanks for being here. You. Yeah, my pleasure. Nice so, to connect with Seattle also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've always got a home here. You know that. I do know that. Uh, so you're in uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia. Um, let's talk about that right now because we're living in an interesting time, obviously. I always I always start the show with that, but there's no other way that I can <laughs> it's, say it. It's very true. It's an interesting time. Um, but in, in uh, uh, COVID has an upsurge, and now they're shutting everything down in Europe. What's life like for you right now? It's changed radically in the last week. Uh, we've had, we had, we were kind of one of these, I mean, it's a very little country, it's 2 million people, but we were one of, you know, you would see even in things like Wall Street Journal, you know, Slovenia, the COVID miracle and things like that. Mm -hmm. We had a very successful uh, mitigation of it, I guess, in the, in the springtime and we opened up, we even had shows. I played shows over the summer. Your I guests. Saw, yeah. Yeah, your guests next week, Shiram, they played shows over the summer. Um, there were a lot. Of, there was a lot of there was a lot of small stuff going on, but the the autumn has been pretty brutal. You know, we've we've have about uh, 12, 15 times the amount of cases we had at the peak in April at the moment. So it's really gone from um, really kind of sort of this bubble, parad paradisal bubble, to really full on uh, chaos. What the hell are we doing? Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, it's not going well. But uh, so yeah, we're locked down, uh, not completely. People still going are still going to work. You're encouraged to work from home, of course. But we have a curfew now at nine o'clock. This show will take me right up to the curfew. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, you know, we we're talking about d different technical things that that would have been nice for me to have on my end. I was planning to buy them all, you know, like uh, you know, more or less last minute. But all, all the all the shops have been shut since Saturday and. So this is we're approaching one week of that. Yeah, I mean, I guess we've been down this road. You know, it's it's yeah. it's really unfortunate, but we're we're here. Which leads me to this to this question that I wanted to ask you. It's like, okay, so you you founded Glitter Beat. You were in Seattle. You were in an Americana band, but you went to West Africa. You were part of the desert, uh, the festival in the desert, yeah. and and uh, and I, I I'm trying to draw parallels to. <laughs> People who have traveled in third world countries, developing countries, to where we're dealing with right now. Because if you're in Mali, you just can't go to the store and get what you want. You know, there's no. like, you just can't go to an ATM. There's like, th things have, 
you know, it's a different way to live. You know, it's like, am I going to be okay if I eat this food? Is this water okay? You always have to think this. We're not at that point right now. But I'm, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to drive with Sama is to always never give up hope. Because yes. as human beings, we we survive and sometimes we thrive in difficult situations. And if you look at artists, if you look at people in places um, such as Mali, as an example, um, they can deal with turmoil. For a long time, Mali was a um, this wonderful, calm country surrounded by conflict. Now, of course, it's in the middle of conflict, but the people there are still, you know, they're hopeful. They're still, they're still, um, they're still working, and they're using technology in a really interesting way, where it's like. You know, everybody gets a cheap Chinese phone and they're able to send stuff via WhatsApp. You know, I'm getting stuff sent to me directly from artists right now. It's like it doesn't have to go through like, you know, the the classic yeah, yeah, before yeah. it gets to me. It's great. It's great. But 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 one of the things that it's just like, you know, when you said like, you know, I can't get this stuff I was going to. I can't right now. Um, you know it's important for people to think about this in a context of like this humanity as a species has gone through a lot of stuff in the West. It's been a cakewalk. It's been like, you know, now world war two, not so much. Um, but now it's, you know, it's, I, I'm thinking if this is an opportunity for us to kind of connect with people in other places, because knowing that we can all, this can happen anytime. And we, we all, uh, kind of like need to start looking at um, refugees as an example, uh, yeah. people that are that are that are um, that are uh, fleeing horrible conflicts per se. Open up your hearts to these people. Open up to the humanity of what's going on, and just don't be a dick about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, there's, a, there's a lot of that. Uh, no, I think you you do you do experience that. You know, I spent you know months in West Africa over over a period of years, and <clears throat> it does make you reconsider a lot of things you know when you when you when you see that but one thing that comes out of it is i always even in the in the darkest times there was this there was a sense of resilience and hope uh, as as you as you pointed out and i think that that's you know it's hope, hope hope there is it's it's not a luxury it's a necessity because the situation is you know so stacked against you that you really have to find you know this motivation somewhere and um, yeah, it's uh, it. it I, I I remember Damon Albarn from Blur. He said something I thought was pretty prophetic many years ago, and it becomes even more so now. He said, on his first trip to Bamako, he he, at first, you know, felt like, you know, you you, you see street vendors and people lit literally living on the street, maybe not sleeping there, but they're there all day long, well into the evening, well into the night. People, you know, really hustling, very desperate situations, mm -hmm. and then you see brand new, like BP gasoline stations right next to them. And he said he couldn't decide at first if he was looking at the future or the past. But he said in the end, he concluded that he was looking at the future of the West. That yeah. this was not that they were not so much going to to transform in these countries to the point that they were like us. That we were probably more going to devolve into a situation that was more similar. You know, yeah. maybe not as radical. It will take uh, more time, but I, I don't think it's a it's a dilettantish view of it. It, it, it we we see you know in some ways we see this panning out at the moment. Yeah, we, we, we were very ill equipped to deal with this. You know, I remember I was in in Bamako when they had a brief scare about Ebola, and how they mobilized. You know, it was unbelievable. You know, they had these hand sanitizers at at bars. That was the first time I ever experienced that. You know, they had temperature uh, uh, th thermometers, these ones you walk into at the airports. This all happened in about 48, 72 hours. There was no big, you know, political discussion on, you know, what, what the, the, is this a public health crisis or not? You know, it's just boom, let's do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we, I think we have a lot to learn from uh, places where, you know, they, they have faced these kind of uh, situations far longer than we have. I totally, I totally agree. And it's, but it's interesting because it's like the propaganda that we're seeing right now from these countries, uh, from current administrations is to dehumanize them. They're the other, yeah. they're the, they're, yeah. and, and, um, you know, we work in music and music is a really interesting space where it, you feel the, the emotion, uh, from what that artist has, is creating 
and is sharing with you the story that's going on there. And that circumvents that, that um, propaganda that you're getting. Um, we could talk about this forever, but I want to get a little more information about you because we're here talking to yeah. you. <laughs> Tell me, um, what got you into music? What was the thing? I, w I got into music really young. Um, I guess it was Beatles records. Late, I'm 60 years old, so this was, let's say, 68, 69. I was already listening to music. Uh, we had a, uh, my parents weren't that musical. We didn't have a lot of records in the house, but we lived across the street. My, I have two, two younger brothers who also were musicians. Both of them were in the walkabouts at one period of time. Mm -hmm. And we had a neighbor, and uh, it was a kid around our age, and his father, uh, well, they, they had been living in the Bay Area, and his father had this amazing collection of like 60 psychedelic music and things like that, <laughs> which we were listening to like when we were eight and nine years old. And his son uh, is, is Mike Wilton, and Mike Wilton is the guitarist in Queensryche, this uh, band from Belgium. Yes, so I know that. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of a very bizarre thing. But yeah, we, we learned about music from Mike Wilton from Queensryche's father. Basically. That is an amazing story. Oh my God, that is cool. And if uh, everybody watching and listening, Queensryche was a, a legendary metal band, still is going strong. Um, going based in. based in um, started in Bellevue, Washington, not even Bellevue, Seattle. Right. Yeah, Bellevue, that's where Washington. We, lived also. we lived across the street. That's awesome. That's a great story. From Bellevue to Glitterbeat, my friend, you <laughs> have a documentary. <laughs> that's a journey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's okay. So the, you know, you listen to this music, and then you started forming a band, uh, forming bands, I say, and then your band got pretty popular. You know, you were like you were a mainstay um, in Seattle. And when we were we were talking about the show. It was like you know, I wanted to focus on your work with Glitterbeat, but here we're in Seattle. It's like, wait, 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 wait. I want to hear more. What's been going on? So, so d tell your little story about like your or your big story about. Sub pop Seattle. What was that like for you? When, um, especially at that time, because it was like Seattle and music were literally the same word in the states for a bit, and still is now. Yeah, I mean the pre. You know, I, I think the, the more always the most interesting thing about the, that Seattle period or that Seattle scene uh, was, let's say, if you if you go back two or three years before sub pop, <clears throat> just the state of the scene was so derelict. Not in terms of talent or in bands or comradeship, but you know, the, a lot of the clubs had closed down. It was a pretty bleak situation. And I always, and I'm not the only one who's ever said this, but you know, the, the, I, I think it is, there, there's some truth in the, the, the narrative that it was a little bit like, it, it, it was such a dead end that in fact, people just concentrated on making the music they wanted to make. You know, there, was, there wasn't this sense of like, well, I need, to, you know, Let's go to LA. That that all kind of came later, but that, at that point, it was very, very. I don't know if innocence to my word. It was just very focused. You know, people just weren't worrying about are they going to care about us in New York because it just seemed so far away and so improbable that uh, I, I think this allowed this very insular scene to sort of seed itself in a really beautiful way. Of course, a lot of crazy stuff followed that, and yeah. a lot of things that had nothing to do with that followed that. And some of them very tragic, yeah. But uh, you know, and during that little that little snapshot from let's say about eighty six to eighty nine was really quite interesting. Um, yeah, it was a beautiful. You know, I have fond memories of it, and I, I think that uh, it's it's. I sometimes wonder if I'm romanticizing it, and probably I am to some extent. But I do believe that there was a real, there was a real, unique thing about. I think it's comradeship. You know, people helped each other out. It was it was not just competitive. Of course, there was competitiveness. You know, you you didn't really love it that your your band opened the last seven out of town shows. You know, by the, the, these out of town bands coming. You know, you're sort of you know, you grumbled about this. But on the other hand, uh, <clears throat> you know, we used to. I mean, in the bleakest parts of the club scene, I remember you know renting like UCT Hall, you know, Oddfellows Hall. Mm -hmm. we, we'd get together with bands and we did it with mud honey once, you know, improbable combinations. And, you know, we, we saw it as like, there was some common interest yeah. and even more than that, it was just for, we, we were having fun. You know, that's also quite important. Does that part, does that, you know, everybody comes from a past and everybody learns from that unless they're insane. Um, did that play a role in how 
you know, you started to travel and did it play a role in the founding and what Glitterbeat is now doing and the artists that it's that it is signing or promoting per se? Was there a connection to that? I mean, it's an interesting question. I, I think, you know, it'd be pretty easy for me to say yes. And why? One thing I was thinking about before this interview today, you know, just sort of thinking about glitter beats and what, what we're doing there. You know, one of the things I really saw <clears throat> when I finally got myself to West Africa and, and saw the role that music played in a community, you know, this, this, this sense that music is not over there. Music mm -hmm. is, you know, really uh, embedded in everyday life. It's, it's not just for rituals. It's not just for marriages. It's just everywhere. You know, it's it's such an important, you know, the way the griot culture works as a, you know, let's say almost a reporting system, a, a, a newspaper, a journal, a, a, a podcast, if you will, musical podcast, you know, it's, it's just so integrated. And, you know, I, I think my taste of that from the Seattle music scene was pretty profound. And I think I carried that with me. It, it did feel like that. It didn't feel like this Mali and griot. Uh, culture, but it felt like music was very, very important, and not important because the outside world cared about us. It was important to us, you know. It was important to each other. It was important to our friends. It was important to ourselves. And uh, I don't know. I, 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 I was always disappointed sometimes when I came to certain communities and saw that it wasn't like that. And, yeah. I, and then I even realized how, how even much uh, more of a magical thing it was to yeah. have experienced that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I totally agree. Anytime I'm, you know, we've both been lucky enough to travel throughout the world, and I always find it if there's a, a an appreciation of a vibrant music scene. Uh, and I'm not positioning this like you know, like uh, um, music in all form. Like even in yeah, countries yeah, yeah. in Islamic countries where there is like you know, music sometimes can be haram, but there is an appreciation for the voice, or even an appreciation right. for like little reed instruments that you can you know, like the classic right. Quran, like that. There's still work within it. There's there's an appreciation for this, yes. and um and um I I find those that's where I get to meet people. That's where I I'm someplace at a cafe or even just like walking and like you know, and the incredible um openness to like sharing food, sharing time, sharing yeah. coffee with people. If there is that, there's just a just kind of closeness that happens that transcends you know, color, creed, et cetera. Um, so let's go. Let's 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 move into this first band right now. I want to hear more about Glitter Beat, but I, I know that people okay. want to see something yeah. from it. So right. what is it about this band from Moscow, uh, Lucid Vox, that turned you on to them and made you feel like, hey, I want to work with this band? I think I had the, this was one of those bands I had the, the lucky uh, break of seeing live, actually. Mm -hmm. I saw them. Uh, we have a showcase conference here in Ljubljana called Ment, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it, uh, they were playing in a really small club, and I came in, and it was just electrifying. I mean, it, it's it, it, oh, I always really believed in bands, and that this this is really a band, and in, in, in the sense that in some ways. You know, the walkabouts were like that to a large extent. You know, like if you were to take them apart and put them in other contexts, especially when we started, it probably wouldn't float at all. But somehow when we got together, we we filled in each other's blank spots and kind of you were able to raise ourselves, you know, both individually and collectively. And Lucid Vox is a great band like that. I mean, they they literally learned to play to be in this band. You wow. know, it's like they have no experience playing outside of this band. And it's such a beautiful thing to see because it's so completely interlocked and and uh, yeah, it's it's just it's very democratic, but it's not democratic in this bland way where you know nothing happens or they've shaved off all the edges. It's quite the Got opposite. It. Was that also the, did the walkabouts form to be this the band or did, was it more organic? Just curious. Yeah, yeah, we did. We were like, that's. I mean, that was going to be the only band I was ever going to be in. I mean, I, I expected yeah. to go back. To, <laughs> I expected to go to back to grad school in about you know nine months after we started. You know, it was never really going to be a band that was going to last for twenty or twenty five years like wow. we did. So, it, it, in a way, you know, I learned how to play being in band, how, how to be a musician in the walkabouts, and I think to a large extent, all of us did. You know. Even even members that came later, uh, 
like Terry came after Terry Muller, the drummer. She she came after we had been playing for about five years, but she, she had experience. I mean, she was a great drummer even then. But you know, we all kind of grew up in that band together. Perfect. Okay, so Lucid Vox out of Moscow, uh, Glitter Beat artist. This is uh, their new video, newish video, Runaway Ensemble, yeah. Sales Circuit Music and Art with Chris Ackman. <laughs>
Lucid Vox out of Moscow. I'm here with Chris Ekman of Glitter Beat Records, co-founder of Glitter Beat Records, and um, who signed and is releasing that band. What? Um, and we we found out why that band um, is good to your ears and to your eyes, Chris. But is there a particular like motif that you work with when you're uh, when you're working with when you're looking for bands? Because the range of artists on Glitter Beat is pretty broad, you know. Yeah, it seems to broaden even. You know, it's, yeah. I mean, I, I started the label in uh, 2012 with my partner, Peter Weber, who at that point owned a, well, we had been friends for years, uh, but he at that home uh, point also owned another record label. And so we kind of started it under that umbrella. <clears throat> I mean, our, our, our original concept was really quite simple. I mean, we had been working on these records in West Africa, Tamicrest, Dirt Music, Lobi Traore, uh, Ben Zabo. And uh, we just felt like in a way th that that company, they were doing a great job. It was great that they decided to put those records out, but I don't know, somehow quite arrogantly or very naively, we thought we could do a better job. So we started this imprint. We started doing this imprint. and. <clears throat> expected it to be kind of a part-time thing, and it, it really expanded quite quickly. I mean, our, our original, uh, let's say, motto was vibrant music from Africa and beyond. Mm -hmm. It was a very ambitious motto because we didn't have any music from Africa. We just had music from Mali. So there's only one one country we were releasing music from, and we had no idea what the beyond was. So um, that that sort of started to take shape later. And what has so, yeah, lucid vox would fall into the beyond that's for sure and and Shrom and, and others but it's so it's yeah. been it you know you you're um you're finding these artists and that's half the battle is is where are they because right now and it's also kind of weeding through because you and i kind of came up when there was like particular labels record stores yeah. Um, even like CD compilations and things like that. You know, we're old enough to to know how music kind of evolves. Curated, but kind of, yeah. yeah, but kind of killing itself. Like you know, it's like yeah. we did this thing and that gets destroyed, and now we're in this really interesting space where there's more available than ever before. Like literally, my inbox is a hundred a day. Same with yeah. yours. Yeah. How do you find the things that are that kind of bubble up? Um, and knowing that in this age right now of streaming, um, that it's like literally, you know, with Spotify is just one example. If you like an artist, they'll make you a radio station for that artist or the algorithm will. And then you just listen to that all day and you never even get to know the artist that that, that algorithm is, is programming. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just you're in a mood. But Glitterbeat is a curatorial, editorial persona now like artists uh, listeners or viewers will go to glitterbeat to find a particular thing so that's kind of an interesting uh way of looking at it and i'm still trying to wrap my brain around it it's like how do i play to an algorithm how do you guys do that how do you oh we don't you know we we we, we think of it very very <clears throat> much on a uh emotional you know mm -hmm. visceral level i think that's just the best way to describe it, you know, more now we've developed a team over the last five years. There's there's basically four of us working day to day, and then our, my partner Peter's involved too. Uh, in the end, him and I make the final decisions what's on the label. But now we're really getting feedback from everybody, and I, it's it's about does it make you go wow? You know, if it doesn't yeah. make you go wow, it, there's there's barely a place in this as you said, this insanely overcrowded ecosystem, I can't imagine, you know, going to battle for something that in, in, in such a tough climate that doesn't make you go well. You know, if you're not saying, well, you know, how are you going to convince anybody else to go well? And um, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes we get it wrong, but I still said, well, or he still said, well, or, or Sylvie who works there or Ira or yeah. uh, Jacob, they said, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not how it pans out in the end necessarily commercially that validates it. I think this is another thing. I mean, I, I, Peter said it once quite a while back, you know, 
Like he'd much rather fail at a record he thought was great than succeed at a record he thought was, you know, not so great. Yeah. It, it's, it just feels kind of hollow. And I, I, maybe that's romantic. I don't know. I, I don't think it is because, you know, as you said, in this algorithm dictated world, uh, musical world or ecosystem, it becomes much more difficult to differentiate actually. And if you expect people really to invest, because still, you know, we, we saw this during COVID, you know, what was the whole thing about this explosion of Bandcamp? It's the idea that there you can actually inject money into the ecosystem directly yeah. uh, uh, in, in, a, in a more sizable amount than you can through listening on Spotify, even if you're a premium member. You know, and I think this started to gain some traction and some understanding among, among music fans. And if we want people to do something more than just sign up for Spotify and, and stream for free, buy an LP, buy a CD, uh, buy a download, you know, we need to give them something that they're going to go wow about. Yeah. That they have to feel that enough of a connection, enough of a, of a drive to, to take that extra step. And it's, and it's not about whether it's cool or not cool. It's about, does it, do, do you want to interact with this music again? Yeah. You know, it's something like that. So I, I don't know. I think it's not even a bad business model if we, if I was there to use those terms, because I barely consider myself a businessman, but you know, to, 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 you know, say it's a good business model to do stuff that's visceral and wow, you know, that, that people really connect with emotionally. I find that my, now, literally, in the age we're living in more than ever, and especially, so. especially, you know, we started this conversation talking about the power of music and the power of music to transcend and, and, and for you to connect with whatever it is that you're trying to connect with. And in some ways, you know, transcend the ego. You know, so like, what are these cool. artists? What are these expressions from different parts of the world that can help you do that? You could have anything like Ganawa, where it's actually like, this song will actually help you deal with depression. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you take... Prozac, this actually is this music that helps you do that. And here's a thousand year old history of it, how it showing you how it works to down to like, I want to keep listening to these artists. I like who they are. I like uh, Lucid Vox. I want to know more about them. I want to spend time with them. I want to wear their T-shirt. I want to, um, you know, I want to support them via Bandcamp and whatever. And, and it is a way to make a relationship, especially now where relationships are hard and relationships are even harder because, you know, we talked about this before, but in the West, it was like, especially now, it was like bad, and then it got better. And then it's bad again, it got better. Now it's like bad, oh wait, it's worse. Oh wait, it's gonna be even worse now before it gets better. And music and these artists, and especially artists where that that kind of come from, from a different perspective and, and kind of like make you feel interesting. Like when you're dancing in a nightclub and you're dancing to a song you've never heard before, you're dancing yeah. in a different way or like the analogy I use like and you at these festivals that both you and I have gone to is like when you see a band for the first time and suddenly they start playing and everybody in that room falls in love with each other like you know there's just something that happens with that yeah. that's power that's power and that lingers you know it's not like you know like blah I saw something and I like I forgot about it like you know at blockbuster epic that sticks with you for a long time and that I think it's yeah, I agree. And I think it's, you know, the, this kind of diversity of experience that is available in music, if, if it gets heard, if, mm -hmm. if, if, let's say, these more hidden musics get heard, it, it, you know, it's amazing. Like, you know, it's, it's I mean, I, I have nothing against 4-4, you know, programmed electronic music. I, I, there's, there's, you know, stuff in that realm that I actually I deeply love. But on the other hand, if you find yourself in that club that you're talking about dancing to a rhythm that you've actually never heard before, you know, in a, a, a and possibly even using it, some instruments that you've yeah. never heard before. I mean, that's a really profound experience, and yeah. uh, that that does make a bonding, I think, with with people when when they've had that, and it does take you somewhere else, and it does open your mind, which is you know, what what you know the best music sh I, I think should be doing. Yep. So you're also you know I talked about this when I introduced you. You're a producer. Um, yeah. And you're doing subjects, so you're you're deep into this space. And I'm I want to play this next video of an artist um, that I got a chance to interview at Womex in 2015 in Budapest. This is Aziz Ibrahim, and you okay. produced this record. So yeah, I'm going to um, tell me first, like what what took your relationship with her from 
I'm running this label. We're going to sign you. We're going to release this record to like, hey, I want to produce this. I've got an idea for this sound. It actually came together. I mean, when she approached the label, it was through a conduit, a, a guy that she had been, she had released one record with him. And he was sort of feeling like he couldn't, you know, like she was such a great artist that, you know, he was running it, a very small label himself, kind of a bedroom thing, really a visionary guy. He, he did a lot of uh, release, to, actually released the first Bombino record, the, okay. the, the, the by the by the Campfire record. Uh, Cedric and Cedric, you know, really, really uh, made a big contribution to, let's say, desert music from mm -hmm. from Africa. But with Aziza, he felt that she needed something else, and he actually he knew that I had worked with Tamacrest as a producer, and he said, "I have a proposal. Here's this artist. I I knew her. I had her EP already." He said, "Would you guys be willing to take her on a label? And Chris, would you be willing to produce her?" I've already talked to her about it, and then I met her, and we talked. And uh, that's how it that's how it developed. So it kind of all came as part of a package deal from the beginning. Perfect. Okay. Let's let's see. This is Aziz Ibrahim for Western Sahara, and uh, this is.
That is beautiful. Aziz Ibrahim, yeah. um, I fell in love with her the first time I, I got mm. a chance to see her. And her story is fascinating. So um, we're here with Chris Ekman. This is Sama Sales Circuit Music and Art, co-founder of Glitterbeat Records, which uh, put out that record. He also produced it. Um, what, you know, the, the thing that really moves me with, with this, with, with artists such as Aziza is that she comes from a part of the world that's not even like a country that's mm -hmm. been uh, going through a constant civil war for years that is just kind of forgotten. And so, um, you know, I'm not going to get political about this, but musicians and music like this, she can she can tell the story about uh, her people and her struggle and her culture in a way that news or, you know, just isn't going to hit people on an emotional level. It's just this, it's one of these things that happens with these kind of art forms, specifically with music, is that people really start feeling um, for what they're going through and might do something to make their lives better. And the reason I'm bringing this up is like, obviously, we're going through a, a difficult time, different levels. You know, you and I are here right now. We have electricity. We're not at a point right now where there's no food in the shelves or anything like that. But but I am just I'm always curious as as you know, as Sama started in March with COVID, is that like, what can we do to get people closer together? What can we do to get people to kind of like see each other as, as we're all in this together and we have to be together to deal with climate change, to deal with injustice, uh, you know, the, the, the BLM movement globally, Black Lives Matter movement globally. And for you, you two, you guys and gals to start Glitterbeat plays a part in that because, you know, there's, we were just talking about 4-4. Four, four. You can make a crap load of money uh, releasing, you know, just preset electronic dance music. You're taking a risk here with this. And and you're even taking a bigger risk because she's not singing in a language that's, you know, part of the classic colonizing languages, French, English, Spanish. It's like you you you, you got to be a romantic fundamentally to do this stuff. So I'd love for you to speak about that a little bit. Like, you know. When you have these kind of conversations, I have these conversations with my wife too. It's just like, okay, so children, school, we're <laughs> gonna be okay with this, and it's like, yeah. Yeah, yes, we will. But in the back of your head, it's like, what is that thing that keeps you like, okay, you know? And you guys are you're successful, um, but it's not like you know, success. It's no, it's, no. it's an interesting <clears throat> thing. I don't know. I think. You know, back to where you started, I think one thing is, you know, how, how, what can we do in these times to bring ourselves together? And uh, an artist that you and I talked about before we started this tonight uh, uh, from Pakistan, Ustad Sami, mm -hmm. he has this great line that singing is listening. And I think that that's, you know, it's this dichotomy, you know, like we, we always perceive as the performer, as someone who's who's doing something and we're listening, but actually musicians, you know, are listening to each other and are listening even to, you know, the, the space that they're in. And I think this idea of listening is what is in terrible short supply in, you know, I think all of our cultures and, you know, it's true in Slovenia, it's true in, in Seattle, it's true uh, under our, our semi-dictator, uh, Janis Jansha, it's true um, under your semi, or I'm American also, so, <laughs> semi dictator. No, we need to, and I'm sure it's true in Pakistan where they have a semi dictator. Yeah. You know, it's it's just it's it's all the same. And the problem is we we are in great danger of uh, losing this ability to listen to each other. And I think you know, an activity like music, especially immersive music, that gives us a space to connect. You know, it's not just telling us what to think all the time. You know. Um, uh, music built around, you know, uh, drones and uh, built around repetition and built around uh, spiritual grace and generosity, uh, as so much of the music in the world is. Uh, opening space for that kind of music, I think, allows us to connect. It gives us more connection, not just with people from other cultures, but giving us a space to to work out some of this contemplation and reflection and yeah and things like that and i uh you know w with ian brennan who you had on on your show uh, uh i knew that he had other recordings of ustad sami besides the ones we put out on the first record mm -hmm. and when i was in lockdown in march <clears throat> i don't know i just had this idea i just said you know we should 
release something again? And he said, well, yeah, you know, in a couple of years, I said, no, this year, <laughs> like yeah. now, you know, like I, I, I you know, because I knew that there were longer tracks on the second, the, the rest of the stuff. We, we sort of picked some of the shorter ones where he did for the first release. And I had seen Ustad Sami play live and it was extremely immersive. You know, he, I think he played in one hour, he played two songs, two yeah. compositions. And I just felt like, okay, one thing that this, this you know, rather, uh, uh, you know, deeply unfortunate situation we find ourselves in, what it does give us some space maybe to slow down, maybe to, to reflect. And he, having art that also reinforces that is also, I think, an important element to it. Yeah. No, completely. And uh, um, especially for somebody like Ustad Sami, and um, the he represents a particular culture and there's a nuance to what he's going through. Like he's talking about pre-Islamic music. He is, you know, he's got, uh, he's got a bunch of people pissed at him and he's holding on to this tradition. And when you hear him live, it's transcendent. Like, you know, he's doing stuff with his voice. That's just like, what just happened? Those are 52 notes that are yeah, manifesting yeah. here. Um, but it's, he's not an opera singer. He's not, he's not in the, um, the frame of like the classic system where you kind of like know what to expect, which is great. It's love, I love opera, I love that. But it's yeah, he, no, it's a different thing. It's a different experience. It's a different experience. He represents something, and he brings in a particular like with some it's Seattle circuit music and art. He represents the art form. He brings in the backstory, like you know the 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 a whole range of things which are stunning and so different than what we're used to. And so it's, it's, an, it's an opportunity to learn, but learn in a really nice way. We're going through this right now. My kids are homeschooling, is off and are. They're yeah. bored out of their mind. You know, they're yeah. like, we're, at school is just the hard stuff, the learning. I'm not spending time with anybody. I'm not really exploring. And the same, this is a weird analogy. I apologize for that. But it's the same with Ustad Sami. It's just like, you, with this music, you're learning so much more about this culture. You're, 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 um, your your life is so is so better um, mm. by experiencing this. It's kind of like when you discover a new cuisine. You're like, I can never go back to this. This is yeah, just yeah. blowing my mind here. I th there's so much there. There's so much potential there, and people do connect with that. And I think this 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 leads me to where this whole thing started in Mali with bands such as Tommy Crest. You know, there, what 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 is it that made desert music so freaking popular you know and i'm 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 on it i'm asking this to a lot of people because you know i've seen skate i've seen different waves of global music world music right. work their way through you had the brazilians then buena vista suddenly everybody's playing cuban music of a particular time the 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 ability for desert music from west africa be it tenado when bombino tommy crest um they just Fatma Diarwa, you know, they're able to hold on. They're able to get booked for huge festivals. They're selling out places like even in Seattle, which is so far away from Mali. You know, mm. the further you can go is Alaska. Mm. What, to your experience, what is it that keeps that that thing flowing? What is it about that? I, I think in a lot of ways, it's. Uh, I mean, it's well. Let's let's start with. The, the, maybe the, the, even the most obvious. It's it's amazing music. You know, it, it yeah. is it's stuff. It's it's uh, it has an incredible power to it, um, and I, th I think it hits people on a very physical level, and I think emotional level. And what, one of the, the reasons I think it it works better than let's say some musics. You know, for example. Uh, you know, gamelan music from Indonesia, which is quite complex. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that there's a, you know, a dumbed down simplicity to, to Tuareg desert music. It's the opposite. It's, it has such an openness to it. It's a sophisticated openness. And this invites people into it in, in a way, at least invites our Western ears into it, maybe easier than some things. And it's, you know, it, it, it makes no... You know, if you when you really talk to musicians like Tenara Wen or Tamakras Bombino, you know they see themselves as part of this rock lineage. Actually, that you know it, this is not something that was you know merely uh, impo imposed upon them. Uh, it, it's it's uh, so, something that they, they they actually connect with. You know the idea that you know they listen to rock music, Santana, yeah. Dire Straits, 
This is not something that somebody handed them some cassettes and said, listen to this and see what you can do. You know, some, <laughs> you know, some alchemist dreamed this up. You know, this is something that developed over a 40 year period in the desert and became very strong movement and very real and very rooted there. And, you know, I think we connect to it also on that level because we see it as something that's vaguely familiar, but also very different okay. than what we're used to. Okay, so there's there's a connection based on on um, you, yeah I could see it like you know the people you see um, shows especially here like you throw a rock in Seattle as you know you're gonna hit a guitar player it's just right. it's gonna happen <laughs> and they're all coming out to these shows and they're all just like watching yeah. the chord changes and it, it's an interesting way um, to to I'm just ecstatic you know where it's like wow you're here you're really in this because sometimes it could be very you know. Uh, uh, a silo perspective. Everybody's playing sure. the same stuff. And to have these kind of experiences, to be able to share these artists is phenomenal. I want to play uh, Tommy Crest. Tell me about this band and what drew you to it and your history with them. Well, I think, you know, we wouldn't probably be having this conversation at the moment if it wasn't for Tommy Crest because they were the band that kind of separated us from being this, which I would have been content with, and Peter also, kind of a hobby label, you know. Mm -hmm. We we're going to start an imprint. We we're going to release a couple records a year. It would have been also very fun, I think, <laughs> in a lot of ways. But uh, you know, it, we, we we had some amazing experiences and continued to do it because we did it the way we did it. But Tammy Crest's record, I think, was the third record that we released at Glitter Beat. Tammy Crest's Chatma, which was their third album. I had produced the first two, and then also this one, the third one, and it just took off. Uh, inexplicably, yeah. I mean, the quality of it was high. I mean, they're a great band. They were developing all the time. They had the songs, they had the playing, they had the magic, and uh, it, the world was, uh, you know, this niche, especially the so-called world music, global music niche, was really ready for it. And it, it sold phenomenally, and it really gave us a foothold to keep doing it. And uh, it's been wonderful for them also. I mean, they, they took a hard hit this year with COVID. They had over 50 shows in Europe uh, canceled, uh, you know, deep breath. Uh, hopefully they'll be back late next year. It's been very tough for them. I mean, the, 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 all the political crises in Mali since 2010 have hit them hard. It's hit the desert hard. But the music has, has a deep beauty, and uh, I, I feel gr very grateful to have met them. Perfect. Okay, Tommy Crest and Summer, see how circuit beacon art.
That looks awesome. I want to be there. Me the too, mental. right now. <laughs> yeah. Be great. Back when we, we could, back when we could go places. Yeah. yeah. Well, you don't have to be quarantined for 14 days to get special. We'll get there. Okay, we'll get no, through it. Get um, Chris Segment, co-founder of Glitterbeat Records. This is Sama, CS Circuit Music and Art. I'm Derek Mazzoni. Let's do a little bit of business. You guys have um, a bunch of stuff coming up. In November, you've got the Israeli... Um, Iranian singer slash actress Liraz record yeah. coming out. That's out. That's the 13th of, of uh, November. Yeah. 13th of November. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what else? Um, first of all, everybody who's watching right now, go to Bandcamp, Glitter Beat, download these artists' uh, work. Yes, you can stream, but it's a completely different relationship. Please download it. Get their. Uh, get their. Their. It's it's great. It's great. You will. You the T-shirt you're wearing. Uh, you will love, and everybody will go like, "What's up?" Once you get outside of the house, and people get to see you. Um, what other releases should we know about that are coming out tonight up? at midnight? Uh, also, your midnight, ours, same time. Uh, we have a three-song digital EP coming out from the Turkish, uh, wonderful Turkish singer uh, Gaia Suekyol. Oh, she's awesome! Yes, perfect. So that's a three-song digital only release. It'll also be at Bandcamp. We don't do a lot of digital only, but she was, she also, you know, had a fertile time mm -hmm. during the lockdown and she just wanted to release some music, just get it out really fast and immediate. So yep. she's got a pretty wild video that she's got attached to and that all gets debuted tomorrow. Perfect. Okay. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing that. Um, a quick, quick thing um, that I wanted to ask you, Europe is going through some really interesting times and you're seeing these like, um, how do I describe it? Almost like retro future manifestations of Anatolian rock or huge bands like uh, Grungbin in, out of Austin doing um, Thai and Zimbabwean yeah. riffs. And so from a, you know, from a generational perspective, this is stuff that would have been impossible to sell when it was just record stores or labels. Yeah. But right now, you know, it's blown up. I hate sound. I sound like such an old fart. The kids today, they love this <laughs> shit, and well, they're finding it, and they're finding it through streaming. And they're like, and they, these bands are doing well, and you can see, you know, that they're doing well. But they show up on podcasts. They're showing up on like, on uh, on KXP. They're showing up on a tiny desk at NPR and other places. This is stuff that like twenty years ago would have been like, yeah, that's interesting. That's ethnic, yeah. or it's like whatever it is. What's your take? What's going on? I think it's just like you said. I mean, we have the band Alton Goon. We don't have them for America. They're on ATO Records in America, but through mm -hmm. in Europe, they we release them through Glitter Beats. I mean, also the same. It's it's a very international, global connection. I think it's the good side of globalism. Yeah. This, this ability to hear, you know, things from everywhere. It becomes, you know, I I I, I think cultural appropriation is always a, a, a worthy conversation to have. But it's also almost we're not keeping pace with that. We're, we're, we're kind of transcending into something else where it's very democratic and it's very consent oriented. It's a two way conversation that's happening yeah. from all over the world. It's bands from the Sahara downloading rock music from Brooklyn. It's br bands in Brooklyn like $75 Bill, you know, taking guitar lessons in Mauritania and adding extra yeah. fret to. Uh, Shay's guitar and doing something that's just crazy. I, I played seventy-five dollar bill once in a. I was DJing in Paris, and these f three Moroccan kids came up to me and go, "Like, where, where, where in the Sahara is this music from?" <laughs> they were just so blown away, and I told them it was from Brooklyn. They just freaked out. They each came up with their cell phone and took a picture of my, my, uh, uh, you know, my digital uh, playlist. Yeah, you know, it's it's. I think this is the good side of it. You know, it's the, we we know the bad side of globalization. I mean, yeah, it's it's deep and it's terrible. But there's another side where it's about connection, and uh, that's a byproduct that we don't often celebrate enough, and we need to celebrate it more. And we need music that embraces that, and and we have it. We don't have to. We don't have to create it. It's there. It's, it's out there. there. Perfect. It's out. Chris, thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, we will um, we will see each other inevitably soon. Maybe well, it's one more. I'm going to send you a text about a couple of things we talked about earlier. Okay. Yep. Let's do it. Um, so hold on for a little bit. Uh, hey, everybody! Thank you so much. Uh, 
big shout out to April and Vinita and uh, be well. Bye.